Hello everyone, my name is Justine and I work here at Everett and I have the honor of introducing Kiara Butler. Kiara is the Chief Executive Officer of Diversity Talks, which is a nonprofit which she founded herself and it's an amazing nonprofit. She's going to tell you about it and you should definitely go check out the website when you leave here today. Um, Kiara, well, I first met her actually when I saw her give a TED Talk and I was blown away. And um, you know how when, sometimes when you see something you feel like the whole world needs to see this? That's how I feel about Kiara. So I'm honored to present her and please welcome her to the stage. Hello everyone. Um, so just to give you all some background right now, I'm not well, I am sick. Um, and I just flew in on a red eye from California, so I'm trying to get back adjusted to that time difference. But I'm here and I'm gonna be fully present in this 10 to 15 minute moment that we have together. Um, and so as Justine mentioned, I did a TED Talk in, when was that? I was September. Trying to think. I was trying to think. I couldn't even remember. So it was September of last year, um, and it was the first time me openly saying to a group of people, and really to myself, that I was a survivor of child molestation. Um, and when I say like first time, I mean really first time because I had spent so much time in my life blaming myself for for what happened and so I literally kept it a secret and I, I didn't tell anyone about it or who the person was and so what I want to do to um, ground you all in this moment is to share the intro of my TED talk. I won't go through the entire thing because it's 18 minutes long um, and it was 18 minutes no slides just me up there in a the red carpet but I do want to give you all the intro and then we'll, I'll shift into to the rest of what I have to say. I want to play a game, but it has to be our game. It has to be our secret. That means that you can't tell anyone that we're playing this game, not even your friends. Those were the <coughs> words that he said to me. He first began to touch me around the age of eight. He would touch me in places that were meant to be sacred. I trusted him. And I thought that what he was doing was right. I thought that playing a game with my stepfather was something that all little girls did. But it wasn't until I grew older, after years, and years of us playing this game, our game, that I learned I was being molested. I had built a relationship with my stepfather, being that he was present most of my life. My dad was Honestly, my dad is an alcoholic and he cheated on my mother when I was around eight months old, which left her to raise me and my two sisters alone. My mother was married to my stepfather for about eight years. Well, at least that's when I stopped counting. And so as a result, most of my life was spent raised by my molester. It was spent in silence because I had promised to keep this secret. I also didn't want to be blamed for what happened to me. I didn't want to be judged or labeled as hypersexualized because oftentimes when there's a situation and it's so complex, we place labels on it and we put it into boxes because it's easier in our minds to classify a situation or person than to have the realization that we're all complex humans. And so I shy away from the idea of people saying that I wanted it to happen. And so I told no one. 
Just like I didn't tell anyone that I was gay until my freshman year of college. It took a while for me to accept it myself because I wanted so badly to be straight. I would pray every night for God to fix me, to make my life like everyone else's. I prayed so much that my prayers had prayers. Growing up, I felt obligated to have a boyfriend because that's what everyone asked me about. I remember at a very young age being questioned by my great aunt and grandmother about what little boy I was crushing on in class. I really didn't know what that meant, but I would say a random name like Jeffrey or Adam. But in reality, my soul was crying out for me to say the girl's name that I would constantly smile at and she would smile back. And so I went through my adolescent years seeking love from guys because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. I knew that if I were to come out and say that I was gay, I would have been bullied or called an abomination or both. And so I told no one. So that's like just the first um, five minutes of my TED Talk. If you want to hear more, I really recommend that you go watch it. It's on YouTube. It's entitled um, The Untold Truth. And it's by me, Kiara Butler. <laughs> um, and so I shared that with you just so you can know that that was the first time that I told my story on stage. And it was empowering. And so I wanted to say it again because it's, I spent pretty much 18 years of my life not saying anything. And so any space that I'm ever in, I feel the need to say that it is okay to live your truth. Um, in the rest of my TED Talk, I go on to talk about how we spend our lives trying to live out these false narratives of perfection. And how did we as a society get to that point of not wanting to be vulnerable, not wanting to let others in. And I feel when we do reach that moment of wanting to let other people in, that is when true change begins to happen. Because there are so many people that have the same story as me. There are so many children, both female and male, that are going through what I went through. And no one is talking to them about it. But if we as adults, if we had those conversations with our youth, they would then begin to open up more and share their experiences. And not to say that conversations will fix the problem, but it will begin to bridge the gap that we know exists when it comes to us sharing our mistakes and our past trauma. Um, and so that's what pretty much drives me now. And I didn't realize by being silenced for so many years, it would be the driving force of my career today. And so I'm now empowering students to have these conversations with adults not just about trauma, but about their race, their identity, their sexual identity, their gender, their culture, things that we completely disregard because we're so focused on data. And we're not thinking of the whole human being and what they bring to the table. And so I, I founded Diversity Talks, which is actually a for-profit. Um, so oh no, you're fine. A lot of people like to think that we are a nonprofit because we have such a strong social impact, but we train 9th through 12th grade students to be able to facilitate difficult conversations with adults. But we don't really train them. They already come with these lived experiences and they're already experts. We just provide the space and the platform for them to do so. But in crafting my mission, I realized that I had to put the word train in there for adults. Because adults are like, how are these kids getting ready? How do you know that what you're providing is going to be a high quality service? And so I then had to adapt what I was saying about my youth so that adults could receive it better. And I think oftentimes in society, we do that. We code switch in rooms because it makes other people comfortable. And by doing that, we're also chipping away at parts of our own identity and you don't realize it until you lose yourself. And I've lost myself. When I go into spaces, I say that I'm black, which you, which you can tell, you can't ignore. And I, I let people know that I'm a lesbian. And I let people know that I'm a woman. 
because I come from three marginalized groups. I've been silenced in three different ways and there's no way that I will ever again let a person chip away and choose what part of me they want to accept. And so being from Mississippi, and it's in my bio, a state known for bigotry, racism, hatred, it was hard to say that I was a lesbian. It was hard to be black. Driving around, you knew where to pump gas. You knew where to get out of the car. You knew where you weren't accepted as a black person. But what's even crazier is moving to Rhode Island, the racism is subtle. The oppression is subtle. And in a sense, it's worse to me because at least I knew where I would be called a nigger in Mississippi as opposed to someone in Rhode Island playing like they didn't know. Because we often hide behind that mask of I'm, I didn't know, and it's ignorant. Because in 2018, with the events that are happening in the United States, when are we going to wake up to actually say that we knew and that we were knowledgeable and that our youth are being affected by all of these things? And so I feel like I'm going on a rant and I do want to leave space for Q&A. Um, and so I want to close by reading this quote. It's a from a poet that I got off social media because social media is running our lives these days. But um, R.M. Drake is a poet and it says that maybe you should stop overthinking so much and trust the way life happens. Things change. Every year you grow into someone else and you should always chase the things that make you feel free. And so being in front of you all makes me feel free. Telling my story makes me feel free. Tomorrow, since I did this, I'm going to be a completely different person. And that's my goal, and that's the goal that I hope you all reach. Thank you.